10 Strangest Unsolved Mysteries Finally Solved Using Forensics Is the CSI a factory oh? Some legal and criminal experts have opined that the popularity of forensic TV shows, particularly the CSI franchise, has had a detrimental effect on the justice system. Specifically, they complain that juries have come to expect forensic evidence in every case, and are less likely to convict without it. In real life, forensic sciences are a complement to quality police work, but also have an undeniable place in modern criminal investigation. In fact, these murders have gone cold for years, even decades, until recent forensic developments allowed police to finally catch the killer. 1. The Phoenix Canal Killings on a Wednesday morning in September 1993, Phoenix police fished the body of the 17-year-old girl from the water of the Arizona Canal. The canal, which spills from empty fields more than 20 miles east, winds through Old Scottsdale and Arcadia and past the Biltmore Resort. It meanders through working-class Sunnyslope, skirts North Mountain and then starts its final run northwest. There, just before where the water slips beneath the hissing traffic of Interstate 17, a jogger had spotted blood on the canal bank. Police arrived and found the body. The girl was identified as Melanie Bernas, an Arcadia High School junior. The night before, she had taken her bicycle out for a ride on the canal path, and hadn't returned. Police came to a stunning conclusion. She had been stabbed, her body dumped in the canal. Her bike, police would confirm later, had been stolen. Though police would not say it yet, the moment for them would mark the discovery of a serial murder. Ten months before, on a cooler November Friday, just downstream, past the freeway, near where the canal brushes past the Metro Center Mall, a man had found a human head floating in the water. The head was that of a 22-year-old woman named Angela Brossel, who had disappeared more than a week earlier. Her body had been found in a park south of Cactus Road, one of the parks that flanked the course of Cave Creek as it drains out of the North Valley before it reaches the Arizona Canal. Brossel, like Melanie, had taken her bicycle out for a ride, and never returned to her home at an apartment complex a couple of miles north. Brossel, too, had been stabbed. Her bike, too, was missing. Detectives and the media saw a connection between the two deaths right away, but police would wait nearly six months, before they could deliver the news to a city already on edge, the same killer, a man almost certainly was responsible for the deaths of both women. The headlines were chilling, a headless body, mutilated almost beyond recognition. Victims dumped in a canal. Experts saw hints of a serial killer at work, perhaps one inspired by the movie The Silence of the Lambs. People avoided the canal paths, kept loved ones inside, walked in pairs, and worried, would he strike again? And then, nothing. The cases turned cold. A growing city began to forget, Reminded only when occasional stories arose, murderer remains at large. Authorities pleaded for new clues. Still, nothing. Until Tuesday, when police arrested 42-year-old Brian Patrick Miller, and named him a suspect in the killings. They never stopped looking, said William Herman, who covered the murders for the Arizona Republic and followed the case himself over the years. That was a bee in their bonnet. It drove them crazy. It got under everyone's skin. Phoenix was a growing city in the fall of 1992, part of a metro area of about 2.3 million people. But it still felt like a smaller, younger self to many people who had watched the orange groves along the canal banks disappear. Metro Center, near Dunlop and Interstate 17, was the largest mall for miles around, and would be for another year, until the bigger Arrowhead Town Center opened farther to the north. Angela Brasso lived with her boyfriend in an apartment not far from Metro Center, near 25th Avenue and Cactus Road. She worked as a trainer at Sintelect, a communications company. They told me how thrilled they were that she accepted their offer to work there, and they called her their shining star. Angela's mother, Linda Brasso Strock, said in a 2012 interview with The Republic. I think she was still of the notion that if you're wonderful to people, People will be wonderful to you and nothing bad is going to happen," Strzok said. She was just happy-go-lucky. She never mentioned anything about I'm scared here. Angela didn't return home the night of November 8. Her purple diamond back mountain bike was gone when her boyfriend called police. A decapitated body was discovered in the park the next morning. The killer had mutilated the rest of the body. 
Police would not identify the remains for another day. The killing and the grisly details captivated the media, and terrified residents of her apartment complex. At the time, Jeremy Robinson told the Republic he noticed a change among residents. I don't see people walking around a lot, he said. Usually, there are people walking around and kids playing. Eleven days later, a man named Mark Kual spotted the rest of Brasso's remains in the canal water near Metro Center. Walls, then 39, was known to live outdoors, and went by the nickname Fisher King. Some suggested it had come, from the Robin Williams movie of the same name, but Walls also successfully fished from the canal. His mother had told him she believed he would find the slain woman's head. It was just a strong feeling I had, she told a reporter. Even more disturbing, Herman said, was what police deduced after the finding. I was told her head was in too good of shape to have been in the canal all the time, Herman said. The killer either kept it in a refrigerator or a nice chest. Now we had a pretty good portrait of a 110% madman. He had tall trophies, a head and a bike. And he put the head back. The case was drawing attention from other parts of the county as police searched for similar killings. Rumors flew. Police knocked down some of the more grisly stories, such as alleged similarities to the murders in the hit movie of the era, The Silence of the Lambs. By May 1993, there had been no new killings and no new clues. Police appealed to the public for help. You don't commit a crime without leaving evidence behind, and this person did that, Lt. Sharon Killer, who headed the police department's homicide unit at the time, said in a Republic story. We just don't know where that evidence leads us. Angela's mother wrote an emotional letter to the newspaper, begging people to come forward if they knew who had killed her daughter. The person or persons who know who killed Angie are allowing this to happen, allowing this criminal to have a life, to breathe air, she said. I wish this criminal had the courage to stand face to face with me and tell me why he did this terrible thing to my precious daughter, but I'm sure he is too much of a coward. In September of that year, that discovery that seemed inevitable was made. Melanie Berna's body was found in the water, and no one could ignore the coincidence. Herman said one of the first questions he asked was whether Melanie Bernas was riding a bicycle before she was killed. His sources said she had a bike, a green SPC hard rock sport, and had been riding it along the canal. It was not found at the scene. A shiver went up my spine, Herman said. Now we had two. Authorities intensified their search for similar cases elsewhere, but found no evidence. They hoped someone would come forward. The bodies in each case had been left in visible locations, a park near a busy street and a large apartment complex, a canal along a freeway, near a popular mall. For a while, Herman said, the lack of an arrest unnerved people who lived nearby. No women went out walking alone, he said. Exercise along the canal dropped off. People jogged in pairs. But the second case went as cold as the first, for a year, five years, and ten years. Then twenty. In January 2015, police arrested Brian Patrick Miller at his Phoenix Sunny Slope neighborhood home for the canal killings of the early 1990s. Two women were found slaughtered ten months apart, their bodies stashed in the Arizona Canal, which runs through Phoenix. According to public records provided by the Phoenix Police Department Wednesday, forensic genealogist Colleen Fitzpatrick of Identity Finders International used a research strategy she developed to cross-reference the suspect's DNA profile with publicly available DNA databases. Genealogists post this information all over the Internet, Fitzpatrick said. There are 8 to 10,000 of those databases. Some are big, some are small. You just have to know how to navigate them to find the matches. Her discovery was made possible by matching the Y-DNA profile. Y-DNA follows the male line of the family, and is usually attached to a family surname. Many genealogy enthusiasts post their Y-DNA profiles to public internet databases in the hopes of connecting with distant relatives. The databases are a treasure trove for researchers like Fitzpatrick. It's like a bingo game, Fitzpatrick said. And I look for a bingo match. In late 2014, Phoenix police provided Fitzpatrick the Y-DNA profile of the suspect extracted from the 1992 to 1993 crime scenes. Fitzpatrick went to work. Within a couple of weeks, she identified the surname Miller as a possible name associated with the Y-DNA profile. Phoenix police detectives reviewed records of previous contacts related to the case. 
they identified Brian Patrick Miller as someone on a long list of potential leads. Phoenix PD then independently collected DNA evidence from Miller and matched it against the suspect DNA. The match was positive and prompted police to make the arrest. Miller has pleaded not guilty. He is scheduled to go on trial in April 2017, and if found guilty, he could face the death penalty. 2. The murder of Fred Laster. On June 5, 1994, a passerby came across a dumpster at the BP gas station on the north side of Interstate 10 and US 441 in Lake City. Behind it, she found a bloodless torso. The Columbia County Sheriff's Office believed the torso had been in a black garbage bag found inside the dumpster. They thought the torso had perhaps been too heavy to toss inside the dumpster and slid out of the bag before someone simply dragged it around the back of the container. Other items found at the scene, a blood-soaked mattress cover believed to have been used in a bathtub, while the suspect dismembered his victim, kitchen knives, blood-stained latex gloves and a red flannel shirt. The body had been decapitated. It was missing hands, legs and buttocks. Investigators said it was clean, as if it had been washed. At the time, the body could not be positively identified. In 1994, 16-year-old Fred Laster from Nassau County disappeared. His family tried to report him missing, with two different law enforcement agencies, according to a summary of a missing person investigation from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. They tried reporting his disappearance in Nassau County, where they lived and in Duval County where they believed he had been. A 2017 warrant noted that they were unable to report him missing in 1994. However, a second attempt in January 2015 was successful, to a point. JSO compiled a missing person report, however, it does not appear they followed up on the family's one lead. They believed Laster was with his youth pastor, Ronnie Hyde. There was no indication of any law enforcement contact with Hyde regarding Laster. The 2017 warrant stated, Laster was considered missing until 2015, when a family member spotted a flyer from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children about an unsolved Lake City murder. A DNA test was conducted February 2015 with Laster's twin sister, confirming that the torso was his. Authorities received a tip that Hyde may have been involved. They gathered Hyde's trash and they were able to tie his DNA to the flannel shirt found with Laster's torso back in 1994. On March 7, the FBI executed a search warrant and secured Hyde's two properties, a residence in Jacksonville Beach and one on Thelma Street just minutes from downtown Jacksonville. Authorities arrested him that day and charged him with the 1994 murder. In the search warrant, Laster's sister said the two met Hyde when he was working as a youth pastor at Strength for Living Church in Jacksonville. She told detectives that she and her brother stayed over at Hyde's Jacksonville Beach home, and that her brother played in a church band together with Hyde. Documents also reveal that Laster's family suspected Hyde as the likely suspect for he was the last person Laster had seen. Laster's family declined to comment, but released the following statement, although some extended family has chosen to make statements to the media. We, his father and siblings, declined to be interviewed at this time. Families who live around Hyde's Jacksonville Beach property say they rarely saw him outside. When they did see him, he would usually keep to himself, but occasionally offer a friendly wave to numbers. He walks his dogs and that was basically the only time I'd see him, said Brian Heifer, Hyde's number. To his numbers, he was distant, silent, and aloof, an all-around mystery man inside a mystery home. What was known about him, however, was that he was a licensed mental health counselor, and he claimed he was a Christian counselor at the Crosswater Community Church in Pont Vedra. First Coast News reached out to the church, and Pastor Millwood stressed he was not a paid staff member. He could not clarify what Hyde did there. I personally am not aware of any victims of Ron Hyde that involve anyone associated with Crosswater Community Church, Pastor Millwood said. Despite Hyde's list of community involvement, no one in the community seemed to know him. From his church involvement to social media posts, several experts have been trying to understand Hyde's pattern of behavior. A local psychologist looking into his psyche believes he may have been a counselor to connect with people who are vulnerable. Being able to detect what someone else needs and capitalize on that. That's when they can manipulate, said Dr. Tracy Alloway, 
a University of North Florida psychologist and researcher. On Hyde's Facebook page, we found posts about feeling grateful working as a Christian counselor. Posts against child abuse, domestic violence and suicide dominate his feed. For him, Facebook may present an avenue for him to present his ideal self, the self he'd like to be, Alloway said. At one point, the mother of Shelby Farah, the Metro Pieces worker who was shot to death during a robbery in 2013, said Hyde had contacted her on Facebook. Hyde was telling me he was sorry for my loss in some of the messages, but he kept insisting on meeting us, Darlene Farah said. He was like, I can help you with your son. It makes me feel like he was trying to target us. We can't take this minority report perspective where anyone who fits this mold is going to commit a crime, because that's not the case at all, Alloway added. Alloway believes the FBI is checking his Facebook to look for patterns. On Friday, March 10, the FBI search at Hyde's property concluded, 22 years after Laster's body was found dismembered in a Lake City dumpster. To former Jacksonville Beach FBI agent, Dr. Ellen Glasser, who is also a current UNF criminology professor, this killing strikes her as odd. The way the body was disposed of, or dumped, the fact that it was left as a torso, but it wasn't really concealed, people found it. It's good for police that bad guys make mistakes, Glasser said. But why was Laster's body dismembered after his death? Glasser said there's no telling what goes through a killer's mind. Typically killings like this fall in a category of being a power killer where the killer is trying to exert control over his victim, she noted. While it's been more than two decades since Laster's death, investigators working the case now have a critical advantage, DNA. In 2016, Hyde's DNA was matched with the DNA found on a flannel shirt in the dumpster Laster's torso was disposed of. Once they tested his DNA, you have a really strong connection, said Dr. Ellen Glasser former Jacksonville Beach FBI agent and current UNF criminology professor. DNA technology has advanced so much that back in 1994, it wasn't something that was used a lot, even though it was very compelling evidence, it wasn't used a lot, Glasser said. Nowadays, we can go back and look at closed cases and look at DNA and solve cases that we didn't even dream of being able to solve back then. Glasser said this is the beginning of the case. The FBI will bring a lot more evidence to help shed light on what happened 22 years ago. There is a lot left to be done, she said. A connection has been made, now authorities are going to try and strengthen that connection, she added. Hyde remains at the Duval County Jail on no bond, and he's facing murder charges. At this time, the FBI is asking for the community to come forward if they know any information about Hyde. 3. The Crystal Bislinowicz murder. The murder of a teenager found beaten to death, with the rock by the side of a river in Utah went unsolved for 18 years. Local authorities scoured the highways, and along the banks of the Provo River for miles in all directions. They came up with nothing, and the killer remained free. But a breakthrough in the 1995, slaying of Crystal Bislinowicz was made in 2013, with the arrest of a man named Joseph Michael Simpson based on what a sensitive new DNA collection tool found on the surface of the stone. Simpson was convicted of aggravated murder on September 29 and sentenced to life in prison without chance of parole, making it the latest success for the MVAC, a wet vacuum collection system for collecting minute traces of DNA. The bloody rock was identified early on as the murder weapon, used to bludgeon 17-year-old Bislinowicz to death. The side of the stone without the bloodstains was where the killer had likely gripped the weapon. That side had been swabbed for DNA, but the swabs had not yielded results in the 1990s. The MVAC was used on that same surface in 2013, and it pulled 21 nanograms of genetic material, much more than the 0.5 nanograms needed to produce a full DNA profile. Two contributors were identified, one major and one minor. The major DNA profile produced the CODIS hit, and led to Simpson, then 49, and living in Florida. Simpson was located, followed, and his DNA profile was surreptitiously pulled off a discarded cigarette, verifying the match. In 1995, Simpson was working as an airport shuttle driver, and a regular route to a local tourist destination took him past the crime scene spot, where Bislinowicz's body was found on December 15, 1995, according to court proceedings. Simpson stood trial in September. 
Initially the jury was asked only if he had killed Bislinowicz, and were not told of a 1987 murder conviction, for which Simpson had served a prison term. He had been out from behind bars for eight months at the time of Bislinowicz's death. Once the jury determined Simpson's guilt, the previous murder was revealed, and the latest charge was elevated to aggravated murder, according to local YouTube media outlet KSL. Prosecutors also contended that further DNA determined that Bislinowicz had sex with Simpson near the time of her death. The defense contended that the DNA mixtures found at the scene point, in two directions, according to the report. Another contested piece of evidence was a bloody fingerprint found on Bislinowicz's wrist, a print that was later determined to be a potential match to Detective Todd Bonner, who is now the Wasatch County Sheriff. It was believed by prosecutors that Bonner may have checked the girl for a pulse at the time of the body's discovery, according to the news account. The jury believed the DNA evidence, and though the prosecutor did not push for the death penalty, Simpson will remain in prison for the rest of his life, according to authorities. Bonner, the sheriff, said the breakthrough was entirely made by the MVAC. The main reason we found the murderer, and he was convicted was the DNA technology available in the MVAC system, said the sheriff. If we didn't have the MVAC and those forward thinking enough to work with the MVAC, I don't know if we would have ever solved this case. We scoured the crime scene, the river banks, and the nearby highway for miles to gather as much evidence as possible. Over the years we interviewed hundreds of people. But the case still went cold. It has haunted me my entire career and now it's finally over, the sheriff added. We finally found Crystal's murderer. The MVAC was the subject of a lengthy feature this summer in Forensic Magazine. DNA and cold case experts, and detectives from a series of law enforcement agencies, testified that the mini-hurricane of the technology is far superior to swabbing and pulling genetic material off a wide variety of surfaces. 4. The Suspected Brooklyn Serial Killer In 2004, the Bushwick neighborhood of Brooklyn was shocked when dismembered body parts were found throughout multiple areas such as a subway tunnel and a recycling plant. They belonged to 19-year-old Roshan Brazel, but police never recovered his head. In 2016, a 38-year-old named Wauru Govan was charged with the murder based on DNA evidence. Despite a string of unsuccessful leads and a dwindling number of tips, New York police detectives have spent the past 12 years trying to determine what happened to Roshan Brazel. Mr. Brazel's headless body was found in Brooklyn in 2005, his remains stuffed into trash bags left in a subway tunnel, and at a recycling plant several miles from his home in the Bushwick neighborhood. The grisly killing of Mr. Brazel, 19, led to meetings at Brooklyn Borough Hall, was featured in three episodes of America's Most Wanted, and was discussed by a panel at Princeton University. On Wednesday, the authorities said they had made an arrest in the case, and were set to charge a 38-year-old man with murder. The man, Kwaru Govan, was already in custody in Brooklyn, having been charged in November in another cold case, the killing of Sharabia Thomas, 17, whose naked body was discovered in 2004 stuffed, inside two laundry bags in an alley near her home on Palmetto Street in Bushwick. Miss Thomas, a Bushwick High School student, had suffered blunt force trauma to her head, and had marks on her wrists suggesting that she had been tied up, officials said. At a news conference on Wednesday, Robert K. Boyce, the police department's chief of detectives, said investigators were trying to determine whether Mr. Govan was connected to other unsolved murders in New York, California and Florida, where he was serving a sentence for robbery when he was arrested in the killing of Miss Thomas. Asked if Mr. Govan might be a serial killer, Chief Boyce said, there's a great possibility that might be the case. Although prosecutors from the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office tried to arraign Mr. Govan in state Supreme Court on Wednesday on charges of killing Mr. Brazel, he refused to be fingerprinted, leading to an explosive scene in Justice Neil J. Firetog's courtroom. A dozen court officers hauled Mr. Govan into the room by his arms and legs, hoisting him up, in handcuffs and shackles, as he shouted that he had been assaulted and was being railroaded. When the officers were finally able to place him in a chair before Justice Fire Dog, Mr. Govan complained again of being roughly treated, shouting, Is this what America has come to? Is this what President Trump would allow? He tried to stand to show the judge his cuffs and shackles, but the court officers thrust him back into his seat. 
Justice Firetonk cancelled the arraignment and ordered Mr. Govan returned to his cell. As Mr. Govan was led away, he called out to reporters sitting in the jury box that he was being framed. After Mr. Brazel's death, friends and family members told reporters he was an energetic, grounded teenager who loved music, cooking and going to clubs. His mother, Desire Brazel, said then that he was bisexual, and gay rights activists took up the case joining detectives and city officials in the search for his killer. At the news conference, Miss Brazil thanked the police for staying by her family and being determined to get answers. I'm ready for whatever the next steps will be, she said. Although early theories of the case had sent detectives hunting for a transit worker or someone with medical training, investigators settled on Mr. Govan after they interviewed him and found inconsistencies in his statements, Chief Boyce said. By then, Mr. Govan was already in custody on charges of the murdering Miss Thomas. Chief Boy said detectives had linked him to her death, after he was arrested in Florida on the robbery charge, and his DNA profile was added to a national criminal database. Police preserved Thomas's fingernails as they believed, they contained DNA from her killer. Twelve years later, technology advanced to the point, where forensic scientists were able to recover a DNA sample and match it to that of Govin who was in the system following a robbery in Florida. Govin protested his innocence with several violent outbursts during court proceedings, but police and prosecutors strongly believe the same person is responsible for both murders. Not only that, but Chief of Detectives, Robert Boyce, stated Govin is being investigated in connection with other crimes, believing there is a great possibility that he might be a serial killer. 5. The Slaying Soccer Mom on the surface, Carolyn J. Hackert was an impeccably groomed businesswoman and devoted mother. Colleagues marveled at the 48-year-old's ability to juggle a demanding career as one of Smithville, Missouri's most respected property dealers with the challenges of raising daughters. By all accounts, the two girls were Hackert's pride and joy. The eldest, a talented gymnast, even found her way onto her mother's website in a section inviting new clients to fill in their personal details a nominated date that was special to them. A special date can be anything, upcoming event or anniversary. I would enter March 24th as my daughter's, sick, special date. It is the state gymnastics championships she hopes to make, she explained on the site. So when detectives last week announced that new DNA evidence had linked Hecker to the brutal, decades-old murders of two young women, the community collectively dropped its jaw. Neighbors watched open-mouthed as heavily armed U.S. Marshals marched into Hackert's upscale family home on October 19 and arrested her for the 1989 murder of teenager Sir De Leon in Kansas City, Kansas. But there was more. Detectives said the new DNA evidence, which linked Hackert to M's De Leon's death, placed her at the scene of another cold case murder though she is yet to be charged for the second crime. Diane Alt, 26 was shot and killed in front of her four-year-old son Josh and infant daughter in their Missouri home in 1994, while her husband Tim was at work. I can remember being put in the closet, Josh recalled in 2013. I can remember the police showing up, and that's about it. I think the hardest part is looking back at pictures and stuff that brings back the memories. In fact, the families of the two murdered women had been in touch for years, even holding joint memorial services. In their hearts they knew the crimes were connected. It turns out that Heckart, who grew up as Carolyn Kuhn, had an assy habit of threatening to kill her love rivals. Kuhn and Amsta Leon were dating the same man at the time of her murder. Both victims had been subject to a campaign of harassment and bullying by Kuhn in the lead-up to their deaths but at the time, detectives could find no physical evidence linking her to the murders. That all unchanged in May this year when detectives announced that new technology had led to DNA evidence connecting Kuhn, now known by her married name Heckart, to the murders. Sarah's brother Matt Leon was just 17 years old when she was murdered. As years turned to decades and there was still no rest in the case, it was easy to think justice might never be served. I learned to live with not knowing years ago, Matt said. I thought we would never find out. I thought we would never know the truth. I thought there would never be an arrest. So imagine his surprise when this week, prosecutors announced first-degree murder charges against Heckart, connecting her to M's de Leon's brutal killing. When I found out about the arrest, I was shocked, Matt said. 
I couldn't believe it happened, and obviously it's great news and we're all happy about it. I'm happy to see that she's getting what she deserves right now. Matt said it was a relief to hear prosecutors finally confirm what he and his family have long suspected, that Heckert was somehow involved in the murder. It's just crazy that someone can be so evil, Matt said, and still live a life that she's been living, that she does not deserve. Detectives have said no DNA evidence led them to Heckert, who they believe was involved in multiple incidents of harassment and an imitation toward her romantic rivals. In this case, Matt said Sarah was dating Heckert's ex-boyfriend at the time of her killing. I guess they had broke up, and maybe, Carolyn, didn't like it so much, Matt said. Who knows why someone would act like that. All these years later, Matt is still baffled at how things could have escalated to murder. But he's now thankful for all the community support, as he prepares for this cold case to finally go to court. I want everybody to know that I appreciate the support, Matt said, and it doesn't go unnoticed. Police have also said they believe Sarah's death is connected to the murder of Diana Alt. But so far, no charges have been filed in that case. Neighbors who knew of Heckert said she was not the most approachable, and that she had erected a no trespassing sign on her property the week before her arrest. Briley Carlson, who lives just a few blocks from Heckert's home, said although she did not know her, she said it's news no mom wants to hear. I think as a parent it's just one of those reminders that we're not invincible, and it's just one of things can happen anywhere, anytime, Ems Carlson said. It's not anyone over here goes, oh yeah, I expected that, you know. I think it's unfortunate and for so long to be hidden, that's a tough thing. 6. The murder of Nova Welsh. A former builder has been convicted of strangling his ex-girlfriend, more than 35 years ago, after his DNA was discovered on chewing gum. Osman Bell was cleared of murdering Nova Welsh, but was convicted of an alternative charge of manslaughter following a six-week trial at Birmingham Crown Court. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Judge Patrick Thomas QC said he would pass sentence later on Wednesday afternoon. Police used enhanced DNA evidence to link Bell to the killing. Miss Welsh was found dumped in a cupboard in a tower block in Birmingham, where she lived, in the summer of 1981. The body of Nova, a 24-year-old mother of two, had been found in a utility cupboard in a communal area at Flats where she lived in Lythorne Avenue, Ladywood in 1981. Nova, a part-time cleaner, who had recently split from Bell before her death, had been missing three weeks when her body was discovered. A post-mortem revealed she died from pressure to the neck. In passing sentence Judge Patrick Thomas QC said, I am satisfied that there was here a background of relatively minor domestic violence. There is no doubt at all that the police were called to the flat in order that Nova Welsh could have you removed. There is no doubt also that Nova was looking to break away from you to the extent of forming a new relationship. That you felt jealous of the new relationship was clear. I do not consider it was a premeditated killing. It arose out of a quarrel. In anger and upset at Nova ending the relationship, and had taken up with another man you used force upon her neck. You moved the body from the flat where it was into the electricity cupboard, right up into the back. After that you did nothing, knowing where Nova's body was. Her children were distressed about it. Her family were distressed about it. You thought it was getting a bit hot, and you wrote a letter intending to point suspicion away from yourself towards somebody else. Miss Welsh, a part-time cleaner, was found in the cupboard at the tower block in the summer of 1981 three weeks after the killing bell, 60, of Regent Road, Hansworth had denied murdering the 24-year-old mother of two of Lythorne Avenue, Ladywood, between July 28 and August 19, 1981. The court heard the couple lived together but split amid claims that Bell had threatened to kill her. Bell was originally arrested following Nova's death in 1981, but was later released following insufficient evidence. Bell's DNA was found on an envelope and chewing gum following improvements in profiling techniques. Bell, 60 of Regent Road, Hansworth, had denied murdering the 24-year-old mother of two of Lythorne Avenue, Ladywood, between July 28 and August 19, 1981. The court heard the couple lived together but split amid claims that Bell had threatened to kill her. The envelope bearing his DNA contained a letter he wrote in a bid to cast suspicion on Miss Welsh's new boyfriend. Bell killed her on the weekend of July 25, 
but her body lay undiscovered for three weeks. Gun was found on a lock used to secure the cupboard where she was found. After the verdict, police said the case showed improvements in technology meant it was never too late to secure justice. Born Edmund, Nova's best friend, said, Nova was a lovely person always happy and smiling. She was a devoted mother who loved her two boys very much. I reported Nova missing as I hadn't seen her for a while which was unusual. It came as a terrible shock to find out what had happened to her. I often think about the old times and the things we used to do. I still miss Nova and only hope that her family can now find some peace. Nova can rest in peace knowing that justice has been done. I will never forget her. Till we meet again Nova. Nova's mom, Lorna Welsh, said, finally after 36 long years, Nova can rest in peace. The family can now have closure knowing the person who took Nova's life has been brought to justice. I would sincerely like to thank everyone involved in bringing this case to court. That ins Justin Spanner said, this is a message to anyone out there of any unsolved case who think they are free and the police are not going to investigate. With the advances of technology, assisting our old investigations, we can bring people to justice no matter how long after the offense has happened. While this case is a little rarer, it does show that, after 35 years, there are new opportunities and new forensic advancements that we can use to look at cases and see if there is an opportunity to convict people. Bell was sentenced March 22, 2017. 7. The Murder of Karen Kloss It was a chilly winter morning on January 30, 1976, and Karen Kloss had just dropped off her four-year-old son at school. The 32-year-old mother of two then returned to her Hermosa Beach home, where she was sexually assaulted, strangled by unknown assailant and left for dead. When she didn't meet her friends for coffee that morning, they checked on her and saw a man leaving her home. They called police. Klaus, the ex-wife of Righteous Brothers singer Bill Medley, was in a coma for days until she died from her injuries on February 4, 1976. At the violent scene, detectives collected biological evidence, including a towel lying next to her body, and held onto it for 40 years, hoping it would lead to her killer. Then in 2016, investigators got a break using new forensic techniques. Using a match to a relative's DNA, investigators have linked Kenneth Eugene Troyer to Claus killing, Los Angeles County Sheriff's officials announced Monday at a news conference. Troyer was a felon who escaped a California prison, and was fatally shot by Orange County authorities in 1982. Authorities said he was 29 when Kloss was killed. The new development closes a chapter on years of anguish for Medley and his sons. It's just nice to close the book on this, Medley said at the news conference. Medley had been waiting for 40 years for a resolution, and often thought about Kloss' brutal killing. But he said he would hear her voice in the back of his head, telling him, let it go, this guy is either dead or in prison. I always had hope that I would find out, he said. Kloss slaying is the second case in Los Angeles County that has been solved using familial DNA, according to DIST. Attorney Jackie Lacey. The evidence comes from a relative, who has been in custody and had DNA entered into a state database. Authorities also used familial DNA to help identify Lonnie David Franklin Jr. as the grim sleeper serial killer. Franklin was sentenced to death in August for slaying more than a dozen women in South Los Angeles. But civil liberty groups question whether such searches are legal, and say they raise privacy and ethical concerns. Larry Brandenburg, a detective for the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department's Homicide Bureau, said the DNA searches are useful in solving cold cases from decades ago, when such technology wasn't available to investigators. In Kloss' case, Troyer died before law enforcement agencies were required by law to collect DNA for local, state and federal databases, he said. Troyer was serving a prison sentence for second-degree burglary at California Men's Colony State Prison in San Luis Obispo, when he escaped on January 30, 1982. He traveled to Orange County, where he went on a crime spree for a month and a half, Brandenburg said. Troyer was wanted in connection with 19 burglaries, three armed robberies and a couple of sexual assaults, he said. Authorities created a task force to find Troyer. On March 14, 1982, authorities finally caught up with Troyer, and as police tried to take him into custody, he was shot and killed, Brandenburg said. After Kloss was killed, 
Investigators identified five possible suspects, but no evidence linked them to the crime scene. Then in 1999, investigators reopened Plus case and requested DNA processing of the evidence, Sheriff Jim McDonald said. Forensic investigators were able to create a DNA profile, which they ran through a database of convicted felons. The search turned up empty. They tried again in 2011. This time, they searched the database for a partial match to see if any relatives with a similar DNA makeup appeared. Again, there was no match. Claw's case remained unsolved. Detectives searched for a third time last year and got two matches of familial DNA, according to Brandenburg. One was dead and the other had been arrested and convicted of a crime in November 2011, he said. With this new lead, investigators gathered Dreyer's DNA from the Orange County Coroner's Office and determined that he was Claw's suspected killer. Authorities said Troyer may have had a relative who lived in Klaus Hermosa Beach neighborhood, and he had been seen walking in the area days before her death. I did not believe we could identify who committed this crime, Klaus' son Darren Medley said. 41 years later, we know what happened. 8. The Saturday Night Fever Killer A man who described himself in court as looking like John Travolta, has been found guilty of the rape and murder of a teenager 34 years ago. James Warnock, 56, has been convicted of the horrifying killing of Yayana Yayani, 17, in 1982. She was attacked while home alone in Hampstead, North London, the Old Bailey heard. Warnock, formerly of Harrington Street, Northwest London, was 22 at the time, and had denied the charges. The case was one of the Meat Police's unsolved murders before DNA samples from the scene matched to the former toddler in December last year. In a victim impact statement Yayan Le's family said, For over half a lifetime we have had to live with the daily torture of what happened to our daughter and sister Lucy. All who knew her, loved and adored her. We now pray that we can move forward with the rest of our lives having some peace and knowing that her killer has been brought to justice and that a very dangerous man is no longer a threat to anyone else. It was not until 1999 that DNA could be extracted from the bedspread in the case. The court heard the Met Police got a lucky break in December, when Warnock was arrested over indecent images of children, and had to give a DNA sample. The sample was found to be a match to semen found at the murder scene. Reporting restrictions were lifted, when Warnock admitted six indecent images offenses relating to photos of young children, and a baby in 2013 and 2015. Warnock had earlier described himself to the court, as having been very slim with dark hair, styled like the actor John Travolta, at the time of the murder on August 13, 1982. Prosecutor Chris Benalad QC told the trial that Yayan Le had been with her parents Ellie and George Yayani at their shoe repair shop a short distance from their home on the day of the attack, but went home early to prepare supper. A man in his early 20s was spotted chatting with her on the doorstep, before a neighbor heard a scream about 20 minutes later, the jury heard. Her parents returned home to find jewelry scattered on the stairs and called out to her, before finding her partially naked body on their bed. During the trial he claimed he had been in a sexual relationship with the schoolgirl after meeting her at the family's shop, but the court heard she was a virgin before the attack. Warnock was living about half a mile from Yayan Le's house at the time of her death, the court heard. Police said he had continued to live in the community in the years since the attack. After the killing, a public appeal, including a televised reconstruction featuring the victim's sister Maria, went out but despite more than 1,000 people coming forward with information, no real suspects were identified. Following the verdict, the ins Julie Willat said, lots of people came forward. Hundreds and hundreds of statements were taken over the years. I got a lucky break. It's the science that has solved this one for us. He must have known we would be coming for him. I'm sure Warnock thought he'd never be caught but historic murders such as this are never case closed. 9. The Cornell Story Murders Police in Southwest Florida say they solved the 1990 double murder of an 11-year-old girl and her babysitter with the arrest of a man whose DNA was linked to the crime. We got him, Cape Coral Police Chief David Newland said, at a Wednesday press conference announcing the dramatic break in the slayings of Robin Cornell, 11 and Lisa Story, 32. Joseph Seeler, 54, was forced to submit a DNA sample recently at Lee County Gal, 
when he was locked up on an unrelated charge, Newland said. Police were notified last week that Zeller's DNA matched a database cataloging evidence from the double murder and sought an arrest warrant for him. The arrest caps a long journey for Jan Cornell, who has never stopped searching for answers in the slayings of her daughter and her friend. I've prayed for this every day for 26 years, and could never let go of how he tortured and killed my baby and my friend, Cornell told reporters. The crime, one of Southwest Florida's most sensational cold cases, unfolded in a small Cape Coral condominium community on May 10, 1990. About 4 a.m. that morning, Jan Cornello woke on her boyfriend's couch, where she had accidentally fallen asleep. She was due to start her shift at Cape Coral Hospital 30 minutes later, so she rushed out the door for home, according to a police report. Cornell had left her apartment the previous night to watch a late-night talk show with her boyfriend. Her daughter, Robin, stayed behind with Cornell's new roommate, Story. Story, who worked with Cornell at the hospital, had just moved into the apartment the day before. Cornell found both front door locks were bolted at her apartment at courtyards of Cape Coral condominiums. She had asked Story not to use the bottom lock, as she only had a key to the top one. Cornell later told police that, while she was waiting at the front door, she heard footsteps inside. She assumed someone was coming to unlock the door, but no one came. She decided to try the sliding glass back door. The rear door was wide open. Cornell told police she was concerned, but thought her roommate might have let their cat out and forgotten to close it. When she stepped into the kitchen, Cornell discovered photos of Robin and her older daughter, who no longer lived at home. The pictures had been taken from the living room, and were carefully arranged on an ironing board. I felt sick, Cornell told the St. Petersburg Times in a 2002 interview. I knew something was very, very wrong. I ran up the stairs, screaming Robin's name. To her horror, Cornell found Robin's body in her bedroom. The little girl's nightgown, police said, had been pulled up around her neck and she was cold to the touch. Cornell called 911 as she made a futile attempt to revive her daughter. I knew she was dead, Cornell told the St. Petersburg Times. She was cold and rigor had already begun. But, I was thinking we believe in God, why can't we have a miracle? Responding officers found Story's body sprawled on a bed in a nearby bedroom. Autopsies determined the victims had been suffocated with pillows and sexually assaulted after they had been killed. Investigators said they believe the killer looked at a pornographic magazine after the murders, then violated the victims' bodies. It fits a certain deviant profile, forensic psychologist Richard Walder told the St. Petersburg Times. In the minds of some killers, the murder isn't over until they say it's over. The killer, police said, left multiple clues. A keychain with a horseshoe-shaped Etienne inner charm and four keys, two Toyota car keys and two house keys that didn't belong to anyone in the apartment, was found in Story's bedroom. A pair of white socks that didn't belong to anyone was discovered on a dining room chair. Authorities suspect the killer left the items during the several hours he spent inside the residence. At one point, he took a shower, investigators said. The most damning evidence turned out to be DNA that authorities collected from the crime scene. A crime lab analysis revealed the killer was a white male with type O blood. Authorities were unable to match the DNA at the time to samples cattle of the national and state databases. Nevertheless, they remained hopeful it might someday match a newly entered sample. We have the killer's DNA, Cape Coral detective Kurt Grau told the Cape Coral Daily Breeze in 2010. It's just a matter of getting the right person. Detectives made note of several items that were missing from the apartment. They included stories driver's license, credit cards, checkbook and a 1990 Saco wristwatch that had been inscribed to Randy, Happy Birthday, May 11, 1990, All My Love, Lisa. Story had recently purchased the watch, and planned to give it to her boyfriend. None of the items have been recovered. Authorities spent the next two decades ruling out suspects. The case was handed from one investigator to the next, with the only constant the police department's unwavering dedication and Jan Cornell's unrelenting perseverance. I'll never stop until I find out who heard them, Cornell told the news press on the 24th anniversary of her daughter's death. Cornell, who remembered her little girl as sweet and rambunctious, told the newspaper during that 2014, 
interview that she places fresh flowers on her daughter's grave every weekend. Then 62, she said she was concerned she might not live to see the killer brought to justice. I'm getting older. What happens if we don't find out what happened before I die? She said. What if people forget? I don't have another 25 years. Little did Cornell know a break was on the horizon. It came in August, when authorities arrested Joseph Zeller in the air rifle shooting of his 25-year-old son. That charge of felony aggravated battery required Zeller to submit a DNA sample. Last week, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement notified Cape Coral Police that Zeller's DNA had been matched to evidence recovered from the double murder crime scene. It was so surreal when I got the phone call, Christy Jo Ellis, the Cape Coral Police Chief Investigator said during Wednesday's press conference. I said, are you kidding me? Zeeler, now charged with two counts of first-degree murder, two counts of sexual battery and one count of burglary, appeared Thursday in Lee County Court, where he was ordered held on $500,000 bond. He is scheduled to appear in court again on October 31st. According to the news press, Zeeler, who was 28 years old in 1990, has a prior arrest record. Just two months after the double homicide, he was arrested for multiple crimes, including dealing in stolen property, battery on a police officer, resisting arrest and carrying a concealed firearm. He was reportedly convicted of the charges and served time behind bars. Cornell told reporters on Wednesday that she had never met Zeeler and doesn't believe he was known to her daughter or the story. If he never got in trouble, this case would never be solved, she said Wednesday. This is the beginning of the end. I want my daughter and my friend to finally rest in peace. 10. The 50-year-old cold case. The right tool at the right time is crucial to a criminal case. Sometimes the technology isn't even developed until a few decades later. But with a diligent group of investigators, the passage of time can actually help crack a case. The long unsolved death of a high school girl found by the side of the Garden State Parkway in the fall of 1965 was tracked back to New Jersey's most infamous suspected serial killer using modern DNA technology, and using an impeccably preserved sample collected during the autopsy a half century before. The Monmouth County Prosecutor's Office and the New Jersey State Police collaborated on the breakthrough, which might finally answer all the questions, for the family of Mary Agnes Klinsky. She was only 18 years old at the time of her death likely at the hands of Robert Zerinsky, an infamous convicted murderer. Anytime there is new technology we will take out older files, our cold cases, and we will look to see if there's anything we can do, Mark Lemieux, first assistant Monmouth County prosecutor, told Forensic Magazine. Sometimes we're at a standstill with some of these cases in terms of interviews, or where the case is going, and we have to use science to assist us. The tool that provided the breakthrough in the case was the Applied Biosystems AMP FLSTR Identifier Amplification Kit, according to authorities. The system can essentially take a minute sample and multiply it by a huge magnitude through a process known as PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. The evidence, which had been stored by the state police and then the county prosecutor's office, was still in storage waiting for the right tool. Both storage locations were environmentally controlled and the county most recently kept the evidence locked and refrigerated, according to Lemieux. The biological evidence was taken from the Klinsky's remains during the girl's autopsy, and stored in a sealed container for 50 years. The sensitivity of the applied biosystems tool, in use since 2007, at the NJ State Police Laboratory, allowed the match to the killer. Ultimately, it was Zerinsky, Lemieux said. The modus operandi of the blunt force injuries to Klinsky's had matched other suspected Zerinsky victims, authorities said. Zerinsky would be prosecuted for the crime today, if he had not died in prison in 2008, at the age of 68, according to authorities. Joseph Peter Sack, the chief forensic scientist for the NJ State Police Crime Laboratory, said the applied biosystems kit has been online since 2007. The technology was now available and the right preserved evidence was submitted to make a match. We don't know what we're going to get with any case that we do, it all depends on how the samples were stored, and what quantity of DNA was there in the first place, Peter Sack said. Room temperature can be enough to preserve the evidence for decades, Peter Sack said. But each sample, and each case, yields different results.
a 20-year-old blood stain was pulled and identified in 2002, at the advent of DNA technology, recalls Peter Sack, a 37-year veteran of the laboratory. Other notable samples have been toothpicks, and even chicken bones. The technology is pretty good today with getting profiles, from stuff that you never would have expected, the forensic scientist said. You never know until you process it, you won't know until you give it a shot. Lemieux said the Monmouth County Prosecutor's Office keeps track of the past unsolved cases, and as new tools are employed, they go through the list, waiting to see when breakthroughs might be possible. But this is not a new tool, Peter Sack added. It's been in use since 2007. In fact, the state police crime laboratory might even undergo an upgrade, based on coming federal guidelines. The FBI is mandating that laboratories upgrade their capabilities, from 13 core loci to 20 core loci by January 2017, Peter Sack said. The New Jersey laboratory already analyzes 15 with the applied biosystem simplification system, but is considering a kit without the 23 markers, he added. Zerinsky spent the last half of his life in prison, but not until he killed an unknown number of people, mostly young women. He was convicted in 1975, of the killing of 17-year-old Rosemary Calandre Elo of Atlantic Highlands, the first and only murder conviction made without a body in New Jersey history. He was serving a life sentence when reporters Robin Gabby Fisher and Judith Lucas published a 15-part series entitled Deadly Secrets in the Star-Ledger in 2007. That series quoted authorities who believed Zerinsky was involved in at least five other killings, one of which was the unsolved murder of a Rahway police officer gunned down in 1958. The Klinsky case was not included in the series. Shortly after the newspaper's investigation, Zerinsky was indicted for the 1968 murder of 13-year-old Jane Deruya from Keensburg. He died in Southwood State Prison while awaiting trial.